um, panel event. Um, so my name is Kelly Thornber. I'm the co-director of the Pharma Pollution Hub, and um, we're absolutely delighted to welcome you all to our panel event today to discuss integrating pharmaceutical pollution into sustainable finance initiatives. And just to let you know, we are recording and this will be made publicly available. So um, you might want to consider that if you are sharing your video throughout the discussion. So today I'm going to give a very brief um, overview of why we want to talk about this and about pharmaceutical pollution. And there, but you know, the main aim of today is to have a discussion. So then we're going to go straight into chatting to our fabulous panel um, and you know, really getting the conversation going on this topic. So, oh my slide, there we go. So why are we interested in sustainable finance? So we are the Pharma Pollution Hub. Um, we're a new independent think tank accelerating collective action to reduce the environmental impact of pharmaceutical pollution. And there's two general sort of aspects to our approach. The first is systems approach. So that means we are looking at the issues surrounding pharmaceutical pollution um, from a a very top level perspective, a very broad perspective, looking at the whole of the pharmaceutical life cycle and looking at um, not only the, the sort of the, the obvious influences and factors that drive pharmaceutical pollution, but also the deep rooted cultural factors as well. Um, so we're looking at this from a very broad perspective, but also um, we are really keen to be as inclusive as possible and the reason for this is because we know that if we want to make real world change we need to bring as many voices to the table as possible when developing solutions so we um, are trying to bring together stakeholders from across the system to um, find and co-develop solutions together so we have a pharma pollution consortium um, which is about uh, currently about 70 thought leaders we're hopefully going to increase this in the future and we're working across five working groups that span the whole of the pharmaceutical life cycle all the way from population health to environmental monitoring and management and over the last 12 to 18 months we've been developing a roadmap for action and this is particularly focused at the moment on uk healthcare so um, as we've been developing this roadmap for action, we've identified 31 leverage points for change. And this is leverage points across the system that um, not just the low hanging fruit, but also the deep rooted um, sort of systemic challenges as well. And one of the things that keeps coming up repeatedly is um, sustainable finance as a really strong and powerful leverage point for change. So you know, we don't we don't know very much about sustainable finance. Um, we wanted to explore this topic in more detail, and that's why we're here today to kick off this conversation um, and see what we can do. Now, just very briefly, because um, I know we have a very broad audience, just explaining why pharmaceutical uh, pollution is a problem. So. Obviously, we all know there are huge health and economic benefits of pharmaceuticals. Um, but at the moment, whilst we're reaping these benefits, we're not adequately mitigating for the risks. And in, in particular, I think it's the environmental risks. We are using more and more pharmaceuticals all the time. You can see here the use over the last sort of 20 years or so has been increasing. It's expected to continue to increase. Um, and as our use is increasing, so are our pollution levels. Um, manufacturing is a main is a is a source a main source of pollution, as is us. So up to 90% of the medicines that we consume are excreted in our urine or our feces. And so these enter our wastewater. Uh, we also throw away a lot of our unused drugs into our wastewater. And our wastewater treatment systems weren't designed to remove chemicals. They were designed to remove organic matter. And so many pharmaceuticals aren't um, completely removed by wastewater treatment. Um, and this is a problem because Pharmaceuticals are designed to act at very low concentrations. They're designed to cross biological membranes. And many of the targets in our bodies that they're designed to act upon are also present in wildlife. So these drugs, not all of them, some of them um, are having impacts on wildlife. Um, but, and this is an important point that might come up later, we have very poor data availability 
Um, so in any in any environment, there might be thousands of different chemicals um, in mixtures. There might be thousands of different um, species and thousands of different targets. And although our literature base um, evidencing where the risks lie is improving, it's still not comprehensive. And it's not likely to be comprehensive um, for a while. And yet we need to take action now. So that's a big problem. Also, monitoring data is, is pretty poor as well. So that's that's the background to this problem. So, and then what is sustainable finance? Um, as I said, we're new to this, um, but I find this is quite a nice um, diagram to summarize it. So sustainable finance aims to mobilize the private sector to support the transition to a sustainable future. And this sort of shows from the perspective of the corporate sector, it's about corporate social responsibility. So, you know, companies acting in a sustainable way. It's a, from the perspective of investors, it's about sustainable and responsible investing. And then we have this environmental, social and governance aspect, which are the criteria that we use to define um, and sort of measure these. I say we, obviously I don't really know what I'm talking about here, but hopefully uh, we all will by the end of today. And um, you'll see there's- Hi, speaking. There's some, um, acronyms on here already as we've I'm been good, thank you as but we've yeah. been Hi. oh um as we've been reading about this we see there are absolutely loads of acronyms in this I'm field just getting quotes yeah just how much I don't know who that is um so as you'll see there's tons of acronyms um, we've asked our panelists to try and avoid acronyms as much as possible because we appreciate this is a very broad audience. But um, Matt has created this slide as a, a link, so you can, if you know, if you're not sure, you can um, open this in a separate window, so you can refer to it in case any acronyms slip out during the discussions. Um, and then finally, so when I'm, we're talking about sustainable finance initiatives, what do we mean by this? So these are initiatives, and there's a there's a quite a range of them now that are all focused on supporting the transition to well sustainable finance. Um, so this could be recommendations, targets, a mandate that organisations sort of sign up to, a classification <laughs> system, regulations for you know the corporate sector, um, finance service providers. <coughs> it's a whole range of different um, initiatives. And so um, to kick things off then, so this is what we're talking about today, um, integrating pharmaceutical pollution into sustainable finance initiatives. Um, and we're really interested in what are the opportunities and challenges and how can we accelerate action? And thank you so much to all our fantastic panelists. Um, we're really looking forward to this. What we're gonna do is um, go through what each of them in turn and sort of ask, introduce them and ask them a question related to their particular expertise. And that should take up about half of the session. And then we're gonna um, open this up to questions from the audience. And now um, we don't, oh, excuse me, we've not run an event like this before. So I don't know how many questions to expect, but if there are lots, maybe people could like them so that we can, uh, you know, we could prioritize which ones to ask at the end, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. So without further ado, so if I stop sharing, I'm going to first of all, go to Courtney. So Courtney, hello. Hi, there. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so Courtney, it's Courtney Salisbury, is the global director for the pharmaceutical sector at the British Standards Institution. She led their groundbreaking work in collaboration with the Antimicrobial Resistance Industry Alliance to develop standards and a certification program for environmentally sustainable antibiotic manufacturing. So Courtney, welcome. Um, so Courtney, I've got two questions. So first of all, you know, you've got a huge amount of experience in working in on standards and certification programs within the pharmaceutical sector. So first question is, how can standards and certification programs enable investors to evaluate a company's environmentally environmental sustainability profile? For example, how can they be used to assess how a company is meeting targets to reduce antibiotic pollution? It's a great question, Kelly, and, and thank you again for the opportunity to be a part of this panel. It's great to see some of my experts um, on this panel with me. 
So I think first and foremost, the, the challenge that exists within the financial investment community is how to interpret evidence of good sustainable progress in general. There's um, a lot of data being thrown around, a lot of um, documentation and process being provided to the financial investment community as evidence of sustainable progress in all sustainability topics, but also in the topic of pollution in the environment. Um, so I think the role of standards and the role of certification is ultimately to align um, across the multi-stakeholder um, interest in this pharmaceuticals and, and the environment topic or antimicrobial resistance more specifically. So there's a role of standards to drive collaboration and also consensus building on how pharmaceutical industry actually and healthcare systems measure safe concentrations of wastewater going into the surrounding aquatic environment. There's a, a real role, I think, of how standards can outline what the best practice is to control the right concentrations of um, pollution going into the surrounding waterways, especially from the manufacturing of medicines. But then once you have aligned on the best, best practice methodology through standards, then there's this question of, well, who's conforming to that standard? So there's a lot of self declaration happening within the financial investment community right now, you know, one on one engagements between the investment community and individual pharmaceutical companies, where they're self reporting on some of the evidence. But I think the role of certification is to provide that independent oversight and independent assessment that indeed industry is conforming to this aligned and consensus built standard. Um, so if we bring that into practice, as you mentioned, Kelly, we have developed an industry standard on antimicrobial resistance in the manufacturing environment, focusing on making sure we have outlined how to arrive at the predicted no effect concentration or PNEC, just to throw a couple acronyms at us to start us off. Um, and that industry standard essentially outlines how manufacturers can control their waste streams when manufacturing antibiotics to hopefully help mitigate this broader public health threat of antimicrobial resistance. And then also we have developed an independent certification and assessment process to certify individual antibiotics that indeed they have been manufactured with the right waste controls in place to prevent pollution, but also again, to mitigate the public health threat of AMR antimicrobial resistance. So I think there's the second role is in a certification is the streamlined evidence. So instead of having to you know, go through multiple documents and understand mass balance calculations and intense engineering calculations. Instead, it's just, here's a certificate. And you can trust that that certificate has represents an independent oversight of industry, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. So I think the streamlining of evidence is also a role that certification plays to an advantageous point of the financial investment community. And we've seen evidence of that happening already. Oh, you're on mute, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. It makes total sense. And so just very briefly, then the second question. So from your experience, what are the challenges for creating these standards and certification for pharmaceutical pollutants more broadly? Like we talked about the data challenges um, before. I would, I would say that it goes down to three different challenges, and I'll, I'll keep it brief to your point, Kelly. Um, one is the technical know-how. I think a lot of people are very interested in this topic. A lot of external stakeholders, healthcare system procurers, financial investment community, you know, government and regulators are interested in this topic. But I'm sure Sam, as one of the few subject matter experts in this topic globally, you know, it's not a, a broad pool of people who have this technical knowledge. Um, not only within industry, but also in the wider stakeholder groups, like in the financial investment community. So I think one of the challenges is when we bring people around a table to write a consensus-based standard, is there's sometimes challenges of arriving at that consensus because not everyone understands the topic well enough to really get to that final point of conclusion of what needs to be done and what is best practice. There's nuanced points around, well, where do you, take the um, concentration? Is it at end of pipe in the manufacturing side? Is it in the waste treatment process, in the mixing zone? You know, some technical topics, but the people who are kind of making these debates don't necessarily understand the, con 
the complications with some of those decisions, I would say, um, as a broad statement. So I think technical know-how with the wider stakeholder pool, including the um, financial investment community is one of the challenges. The second I would say is connecting pollution with some of the broader challenges within the industry of, of, of medicine. So connecting pharmaceutical pollution with things like public health challenges like antimicrobial resistance drives interest from the financial invest investment community. Um, and also I would say connecting the pharmaceutical pollution to net zero and the wider climate agenda. Uh, I think sometimes we look at it discreetly as in pollution and net zero and climate change, but ultimately they're very strongly connected as, as topics. So I think to gain interest from stakeholders like the financial investment community is really strongly making that case about how these two topics are interlinked and interconnected. Um, and then the third area I would say is the challenge is the trust in the outcomes. Again, so the financial investment community has developed interest in this topic of pharmaceuticals in the environment and broader pollution from the industry. But there's this question of how do you trust the outcomes or the information that's provided? And again, I think that's potentially where certification can come. But again, even with that independent certification, sometimes we're still having stakeholders ask for more <laughs> without really understanding why they're asking for more, I would say. Um, so I think the question of how much information is enough information and how do you then glean trust and therefore the commercial advantage that comes from the financial investment community. I mean, one last comment from myself, Kelly, is we're actually seeing green bonds now attached to the you know, very specific components of the pharmaceutical industry sustainability programs. And that's really driving investment from the pharma industry in driving change, I would say, as a broad statement. Wow. Thank you so much. Yeah. So wise. And yeah, from my experience of working in this field, I agree with all the things that you've said. Obviously, I don't know anything about green bonds, so I'm going to look into that. Thank you very much, Courtney. That's great. Okie doke. So moving on um, to our next panelist, uh, Chen Di Zhang. So to introduce Chen Di, so he is a professor of finance and the director of the Center for Sustainable Finance at the University of Exeter. His research um, has included the evaluation of current sustainable finance initiatives to see how effective they are in meeting biodiversity targets. So Chendi, welcome. Um, and Chendi, um, can I ask, I guess there's kind of two questions here as well, but so from your experience in sustainable finance research, what progress do you think is being made in developing effective biodiversity targets for sustainable finance initiatives? And are there any specific challenges with integrating the impacts of chemical pollutants in particular that you know about? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, very timely question. Like, um, biodiversity is um, an area where uh, a lot of investors are um, talking about, uh, putting a um, lot of emphasis on. Um, progress has been made in terms of new data available, uh, new awareness on the topic, um, but it's still very far off from where we want to be. Um, it took the community a long time before, I mean, net zero coming into a, a one of the key factor uh, for, for investment. Um, and even that we see policy shifts, uh, we see uh, regulation changes uh, affecting, I guess, uh, firm valuations, investment returns. Um, so for biodiversity, um, actually I would like to share some of my uh, recent research um, on that. So I'm running, um, this research center, as uh, Kelly mentioned, Sustainable Finance Center at Exeter. Um, so uh, we run a few projects, um, um, so including uh, one project uh, sort of funded by Royal Bank of Canada on sort of uh, climate carbon pricing related initiatives. But then we have another very interesting sort of a, a project we are working on. We look at uh, what's the impact of um, uh, biodiversity ratings, as we see in the current sort of ESG, uh, ESG ratings that's available for, for investors. Uh, uh, we all know, many of us know, like environmental social governance issues becoming a hot topic, um, I guess until recently. So there was uh, increasing sort of awareness to this uh, over the past uh, few years, especially, especially after COVID, uh, I mean, um, so, investors care more about the social environmental issues. 
Um, so there has been a lot of research on sort of um, um, uh, carbon emissions, uh, what's the impact on investment returns, but not much has been done. Uh, hardly anything has been done on the impact of biodiversity on investment returns. Right? So uh, our project, yeah, so provides probably the first piece of evidence just looking at um, existing mainstream uh, ESG ratings used by investors. So these are MSCI ratings, Refinitiv by Thomson Reuters, uh, Sustainalytics by, by Morningstar, so all well-known mainstream data providers. So uh, out of these sort of environmental social governance ratings, they do have some coverage on biodiversity um, topics, which relates to the pharmaceutical pollution today. Um, so this coverage mainly focuses on a few industries like um, uh, oil and gas, transportation, energy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but they, they do have a global coverage, right? So investors uh, have good access to this data. So I guess the simple question we ask is whether it matters for investors in terms of their future returns. Uh, does it matter for profit uh, of, of firms they invested in? And do analysts um, care about these ratings? Do they change their forecast for earnings based on these risks of bad biodiversity? And how do institutional investors adjust their portfolio, right, based on this biodiversity information? But um, the the overall the answer is no. So there is no impact at all, right, uh, across uh, returns on average. So. Uh, firms do not perform better or worse, um, depending on biodiversity uh, ratings. Um, firm profits do not increase or, or decrease. Um, analyst forecast error, we don't see analysts becoming more or less accurate in their forecast of earnings. Institutional investors do not lower their weight or increase their, in increase their weight based on the biodiversity performance, right? So um, I guess the takeaway uh, is the current ESG ratings uh, don't do a good job in capturing what's the risk coming from the biodiversity impact of companies. Of course, this, this is only the starting point. It, it's a long way to go. So um, compared to a few years ago, uh, the coverage on biodiversity ratings is very low. So we already made a huge, uh, huge uh, progress. Elliot, I think that's come back to your question. Um, but still a long way to go before we can sort of um, have better measure of the impact um, sort of, uh, um, of biodiversity type of measures on, uh, on firms, right? And then, um, of course, it, this doesn't say that every industry, every firm, their ESG ratings are on biodiversity doesn't matter at all, right? So we do find in some industries, uh, there's, uh, they matter a lot. Um, actually, sometimes the, the effects are very heterogeneous. So basically, they in some industries, like utilities, so we, um, we find actually if you have better biodiversity ratings, you do perform better uh, in the future. But on the other hand, in sort of for mining, in metals, so better biodiversity increase the cost, actually lowers the returns for those firms. So there are a lot of, um, uh, I guess, factors need to be understood better uh, for the investment community before they use this data. Um, and then coming back to your second part of your, your question, so what is um, uh, the challenges related to uh, chemical um, pollutions? Over there, we have better uh, data uh, available largely due to regulators in different countries. Uh, so they have um, um, provide public information on sort of uh, some of the chemical toxic uh, sort of uh, pollutions, right? So investors do do check that. Um, and um, there are a few research uh, on that topic. So basically looking at chemical emissions and firms uh, stock returns, uh, obviously it matters a lot for, for investors. I think the consensus or, or the sort of the most studies find that uh, is priced in by, by the market. So investors do care about this information. And then eventually this information is reflected in, in stock prices in a way that actually more polluting companies uh, have higher returns, right? So this is more, this is counterintuitive. But, but the reason is that, so, so when investors care more about this information, right, then stock prices of these polluters, they drop. But if they drop, they, they become cheaper to buy, therefore future returns for investment become higher, right? But all these are evidence suggesting investors do care about this information that's available for them. But for, for pharmaceutical pollution, uh, 
I guess the first thing we need to do is, as you are doing here, Kelly, is that we are raising your awareness, trying to include data quality. But the key change, if it makes makes any influence for investors in the future, is um, uh, regulations. Um, so, for example, regarding um, pollutions, regarding uh, water treatments, uh, all these will, will affect uh, have a tangible effect on, on firms. Uh, maybe one last point I would like to add is it's not only a, a problem for pharma pharmaceutical firms, right? So largely, actually, it's a, it's an issue for utilities, for, for water companies. Yeah, so it's a, we probably need a wider uh, network to, to find a solution for this. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That's oh, lots to think about and even more complicated than I uh, thought it was, but brilliant. Thank you very much, Chendi. Um, right, so... Moving on to our next panelist, we're going to move across to Sam. So Sam Maynard, he is the Principal Environmental Risk Assessor at AstraZeneca. He leads their SAFE API, so there's another acronym, Active Pharmaceutical Ingredient. So he leads their SAFE Active Pharmaceutical Ingredient Discharge Program, which ensures the effective management of environmental risk from across AstraZeneca's pharmaceutical manufacturing supply chain. So Sam... Um, as someone working within the pharmaceutical industry, what would you say would be the practical implications of pharmaceutical pollution being better integrated into sustainable finance initiatives? Thanks, Kelly, for the intro. And yeah, thanks. Um, it's a good question and a tricky one to answer. I think that pharmaceutical pollution is a complicated topic and we're already quite mature in terms of our scientific understanding but i think the problem with as courtney highlighted earlier i think the problem with being mature in terms of your scientific understanding is means that you you know the things you don't know and that creates an awful lot of uncertainty so in terms of trying to implement um and integrate pollution pharmaceutical pollution into sustainable finance initiatives it it normally makes it quite difficult because you know the things you don't know and therefore coming up with metrics um which are are really tangible and measurable and easy for people to understand is is really quite tricky. I think there's a there's a couple of key points that I think are worth highlighting here. One is the integration term, <clears throat> and the other one is about how we actually incentivize companies. So I think Courtney mentioned integration, and Jendi in, in sort of alluded to some of the incentivizing piece, like how do we get companies to sign up to these things. In terms of integration, I think it's important that pollution is not seen as a topic in and of itself within sustainable finance metrics, and it needs to be integrated into the others, because by addressing pollution, you will almost certainly have impacts on some of the other environmental issues that we face as, a, as an industry. So a lot of the treatment measures that you might put in will have obvious consequences on energy consumption, raw material use, land use, um, greenhouse gas emissions, etc. So it needs to be properly integrated to ensure that we don't have um, an overall negative environmental impact for the, you know, a, a relatively small benefit, for example, on something which is actually low risk in the environment. So there needs to be some integration and acknowledgement of prioritization in there about how and when we address the pollution issue and where we address it as well, because locally it can be important. So I think, you know, the best ways that we see, I think, of doing that at the moment are through integration into lifecycle assessments or certainly utilising the data and the information we get from lifecycle assessments to help us do some of that integration. Um, and then the other issue is around incentives and how do you actually incentivize companies to make improvements? And I think we need to be uh, super careful about the difficulties that we face with these um, issues around pollution so you highlighted earlier Kelly that you know there's a significant amount of the pollution that we see in terms of pharmaceutical pollution coming from patient use <clears throat> and therefore we're quite limited about practically what we can do today to address that issue directly um, as an industry so we need to make sure that the incentives are not binary um, or with a very high bar on them so we can see, we've seen <clears throat> uh, examples of um, sustainable finance um, initiatives that look heavily at things like biodegradability, for example. And 
inherent properties of a pharmaceutical as to whether it's biodegradable or not are very difficult to change. Um, and therefore, if your bar is so high as it has to be a certain level of biodegradable, you know, your molecule has to degrade by a certain amount in order to be um, be classified as a sustainable pharmaceutical, then you will find that very difficult to meet. And I think what we need to look at is more um, more focus on glide paths or incremental gains in these spaces so that companies get rewarded for <clears throat> or can show the improvements that they're making where they need to make them. So rather than focusing very heavily on whether something is or is not um, present in the environment, we need to look at trying to find out where we can improve and really incentivizing those improvements where we can make them rather than focusing on trying to necessarily reach a uh, a desired goal of zero pollution, for example, as has been set out in Europe on the Green Deal, for example. And these are good goals to try and achieve, but the reality is they're not going to be achieved overnight. And to try and incentivize companies to start making these gains, we need to incentivize the improvement steps that need to be made rather than necessarily the end goal. And then key to that is obviously metrics and measurements um, and reporting of those gains so that we can really demonstrate that they are having an impact. Yeah, thanks, Sam. That, yeah, that all makes complete sense. And I, I love the way, you know, you and Courtney have both talked about integration and connectivity with broader, like Courtney talked about public health um, challenges. Sam, you're talking about the broader impacts. And, you know, this all comes back to you know, what I love talking about, which is the systems aspect of this. Um, and yeah, we need to, it, it, this needs to be pragmatic. I totally agree. You know, we need to look at what is feasible rather than what is ideal. Um, so yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. So um, we're going to move on to um, Rick. So Rick, Hogboom is the executive director of the Water Footprint Network and an assistant professor at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. So his research looks at finding solutions to sustainable global water consumption. And I know he recently investigated to what extent large investors care about water when making investment decisions. So really interesting. So Rick, I've got, well, first of all, welcome. Um, um, so two questions. I'll ask you the first one and let you answer that first. So firstly, what progress has been made in integrating water footprint targets into sustainable finance initiatives? Yeah, thanks, Kelly, for having me and also for the introduction. And as you can hear, uh, I'm neither from the pharmaceutical industry nor from the finance sector. Uh, but I've touched on both, indeed, especially in this last research that we did on how investors, big financial institutions deal with water issues. Um, to take one step back, uh, just to be sure we're all on the same page. Um, so I, before I can answer how these water footprint targets have find their way, found their way to sustainable finance initiatives, uh, what is the footprint in the first place? It's basically a multidimensional indicator of water use. And it measures both the water quantity and the water quality. Um, that, um, yeah, as, as expressed as how much water we need uh, for our human activities. So especially through the quality side, uh, we can look at nitrates, we can look at phosphates, but also pharmaceuticals clearly uh, have a gray water footprint attached uh, to them. Well, within Water Footprint Network, we integrated that indicator of a water footprint into a broader assessment framework called Water Footprint Assessment. It's basically an accounting standard so that we all measure the same thing when we measure our dependencies on water systems, either to take from or to emit into, and also how we can then contextualize those uh, accounts. And so what does it mean? What is the impact? And that provides uh, quite a strong basis to then also formulate targets, water footprint targets, uh, or maybe more broadly put insights into these dependencies that you have on water systems. Um, so that can be in the scientific realm. In the end, we are developed as a scientific method uh, that it found its way to practice because it also had many applications there. Uh, but in science, you can think of the planetary boundaries, how much water can we use before we exceed critical Earth systems, uh, but also more down to Earth, perhaps uh, uh, for, for corporates. How can we reduce the footprints uh, of our activities uh, or how do we understand the risks that we are facing 
because of water shortages, because of water pollution somewhere in our value chain. And increasingly also uh, targets for financial institutions. Um, so maybe a reduction in the water footprint of their financed uh, portfolio. So sometimes in the carbon in the carbon realm, uh, they talk about financed uh, uh, carbon emissions. Uh, here we can then talk about financed water footprints. Um, it, it may be a bit technical, but I think it's interesting to see. Often you see finance being heralded as a solution provider, right? They will invest into these well, sustainability project, be it on, on, on reducing pollution or in, in my case, more on, on lowering water footprints. Uh, but then you're talking about financing uh, water, uh, whereas you can also turn it around. Uh, how, how much water emissions or how much water use is actually being financed with all the standard activities that these companies have, which is often uh, the, the conventional financial sector, uh, of course, finances so many activities, not all geared towards sustainable outcomes. Uh, that still have a massive impact on uh, on water system. Um, and the footprint uh, concept can help them there. Um, we have tried, at least from our end, to really get that into corporate uh, water stewardship. So that, that comes to your answer then. Uh, first of all, I still would say through this method, this accounting standard, if you will, so we all measure the same thing. That really helps a lot of companies use our method in their broader sustainability assessments or in their water stewardship more specifically. Um, but maybe some examples uh, where we also contributed would be the CDP questionnaire. CDP is also an NGO that sends out questionnaires to companies, but also to financial institutions to ask them, hey, do you consider water? Do you consider water quality when you make investments? Are you exposed to any water related risks? And uh, 2023 actually was the first year when a questionnaire went out to financial institutions worldwide that also included water criteria, quantitative water criteria. Uh, based on uh, uh, on the work that we did. Um, and as of this year, we will launch uh, yet another initiative, which is the Science-Based Target for Water, or the Science-Based Targets Initiative hosts a lot of different science-based targets on nature, on biodiversity, on oceans. Uh, and the one on freshwater quantity is one that we have co-developed and that will also come out and that allows companies to report against areas where there is already water scarcity. Um, a water quality uh, indicator, and especially one that is as specific as for pharmaceutical pollution, is not there yet. We're a long ways out from that, I'm afraid. Uh, but at least quantity is uh, is getting there uh, a little bit. But despite, I would say, uh, some nice initiatives that we, with our small uh, uh, knowledge center, have managed to contribute to, I should say that, and that's also the main conclusion of this research that we did, uh, to see how the big conventional investors, so not just the sustainable ones, just all the big guys out there, if they consider water criteria, including water pollution? And the very short answer is no, not at all. Um, and even the front runners that herald themselves as being sustainable uh, uh, institutions uh, really uh, scored very lowly on water criteria, both on the quantity and on the quality side. So it, it's a bit of a sad conclusion, but I do think it's the first one that really tries to systematically understand if finance knows anything about water issues at all. Yeah, so a long way to go, but, you know, it's progress. Sounds good. Yeah, thank you. And just very quickly, the second part of the question was about what, you know, you all of your experience in, you know, what you've achieved so far, what would you say have been the main challenges and enablers for driving change? Oh, easy question. It's just oh. do do A, B and C and then we're, and then we're good, right? <laughs> yeah, if only. Uh, no, I think there are, I, I wrote down three things that I think summarize it uh, relatively well, I think. And again, I'm speaking from water, right? So keep that in mind. Um, I think there's very little knowledge about water uh, and water systems with financial institutions. They they, they simply don't know. Um, I must say, if you also make the link to pharmaceuticals, I think that there is also maybe some, some well, blame is a big word, but responsibility for the pharmaceutical companies that also don't really inform their financiers. Uh, on how they're dealing with water systems, either on the pollution or the consumption side. Uh, so little knowledge. Um, I would also say the, the complexity of water. Uh, water is really quite complex to understand the, how emissions affect water systems really changes from place to place and time to time. And uh, and I, it's really more complicated than, for instance, the carbon footprint and the carbon emissions uh, uh, to really account for this in a systematic manner. And the last one, and I think the most important one that is hampering the sector itself, so the finance sector, is that water is simply not material to them, um, which uh, is a word they use a lot. It's not material, uh, which means as much as it's not important to them. Uh, and even more specifically, it's not important enough because it doesn't cost them any money yet. 
right? Um, so it doesn't uh, harm their bottom line. So little knowledge, complexity of water and water not being material. The very quickly, how might we solve that? And uh, again, uh, it's not like there's a silver bullet, but uh, a few things that I have seen, especially on the knowledge side, exchange and uh, education. I think that what we're doing here is great, especially if we can get both sides on the aisle, or in this case, three sides, water, pharma, and sustainable finance in the room, just to learn from one another. Because uh, I say water is complex, but the finance sector itself is perhaps even more complex to, to, to understand. Um, then transparency and accountability. Uh, a lot of things are are are, are very uh, uh, un unclear. Uh, what the emissions are, the dependencies are, what the risks are in terms of water. We we see a lot of things happening here, both on the regulatory side. So uh, we saw some of these acronyms, right? The CSRD for sustainable reporting, uh, the due diligence directive that's coming out, the the TCFD and the TNFD as industry led initiatives also have done something here. So it's not just the formal regulation, but also the industry initiatives itself. Uh, but but I would say here also what could help is even the consumer demand. Uh, and here we can also learn from other sectors. I mean, when we talk about water, we often uh, think about water intensive sectors like food and beverage or textiles. And we see uh, there also the financiers behind these textile or food and beverage companies are much more aware that water is actually an issue. And through labeling, for instance, that uh, this transparency is, is, is getting there and consumers demand it as well. And it would be great if we can take some of these lessons to, to, to pharma, which I think is a little bit uh, uh, well behind on that. Um, and then the last one, and it's been mentioned in different forms, I, would, I wrote it down as harmonize, right? Uh, should we report on pharmaceutical pollution through, through water as, as, as we're doing now? Basically, we say we have water and then we have water pollution. Or do you say, no, we report on pollution and well, pollution to water happens to be a subset of that. And I think the same discussion goes with biodiversity. Is water or aquatic ecosystems that are harmed a subset of biodiversity reporting? Uh, or do we start with, with water as a resource that has then implications for biodiversity? So there, there's a lot of work to do in the harmonization. Uh, and there, of course, the work that Courtney is doing is, uh, is, is fantastic. So I'll keep it at that. Uh, much more to say about it. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I totally agree that the, we often address these issues as independent issues. Uh, this has come up repeatedly, Sam and Courtney uh, and, and Chendi all talked about it. Yeah, these are not independent issues, they're all related, but brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, so we're gonna finally go to Nabuko. So Nabuko Ishikawa is an environmental economist working as an independent advisor for sustainability and antimicrobial resistance policy. She has over 30 years experience with the European Bank for Development and Reconstruction and the World Bank. So Nabuko, welcome. Um, so Nabuko, you've got a huge wealth of experience of working in sustainability within international banking. So from your perspective, what role do you think this sector could play in mitigating pharmaceutical pollution? And well, so it's two questions. So yeah, what, what role can this sector play? But also what approaches have been successful for driving action on antimicrobial resistance? Because I know you've done a lot of work in this area. Oh, you're on mute, Nabuko. Thank okay. you, Kerry. It's a great pleasure to be here and learning from, you know, the distinguished speakers. I'm just you know, intensively absorbed, you know, the information that uh, are very, very exciting. And uh, just triggered by this water issue, that it's it's very comfortable to stay in the silo, but uh, this, you know, the water is under pressure because of climate change. And then different industries, of course, the people, uh, they're competing over the water in the sense, you know, secure the clean water availability, which starts and I think it triggers, you know, the link to uh, water pollution, the uh, how to preserve, you know, the water quality. So link to a uh, 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 pharma sector in a way. I personally haven't worked on the pharma sector, but um, the, my background is uh, international financial institution, publicly financed. So your government is funding, uh, you know, the, this institution, so public entity. Uh, at the same time, you know, the uh, the international financial institution work with the uh, bigger, you know, institutional financial institution as well, because we need to raise the uh, fund. Uh, and also this environmental social, uh, the sphere, that, for example, the IFC has uh, the equator principle, which, you know, the uh, 
joined by uh, various private uh, institutional investors. And then other here too, that IFC uh, 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 environmental social standards. Uh, nowadays, when we said environment uh, and then social, I think it, the area of social dimension is really expanding, uh, which, you know, reflecting my past 30 years. But now we are moving toward uh, specifically environment and then uh, the, uh, you know, the pharma pollution. Uh, the, of course, you know, the, if you were uh, as a financial institution, like uh, my previous, you know, the uh, uh, employer, that environmental social due diligence is a tool uh, to approach to the specific uh, investment project. And obviously, the uh, legal compliance is uh, first to come for you, your attention. And also, we want the standard, you know, national standard, if not uh, 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 applicable specific uh, the pharma project, then international good practice or international uh, uh, standard. So the British uh, Standard Institute to work with, uh, uh, you know, AMA industry, what's the exact name, AMA, um, Antibiotic manufacturing standard that you you uh, uh, that brought out 2022 is a very important uh, good practice standard because you have also numerical and then as you referred it's you know now WHO that uh, you know public consultation finished at January 2024 I think they haven't finalized yet they also. Uh, issued numerical, you know, the uh, guideline. So, you know, again, you know, the question is, you know, the how those two are compatible, you know, technical expert is really needed uh, for, you know, they use such a, a international standard or good practice. And, and also, of course, you look a little bit wider, in the scope, then a corporate reporting, uh, you know, that this is a material document, right? And the large corporations, particularly Euro European Union, 500 more they need to report to. Uh, therefore, they have such a report, and then you review such a report, and then, you know, check with the clients, uh, the, you know, and also you do uh, a bit of media review as well. Uh, and then send it with experts. Sometimes, you know, the uh, uh, audit uh, take place. Uh, you know, the expert go to the site and the test, and then uh, institutional, you know, inside of the staff also go there and it checks, uh, you know, the uh, site. And that, that's the due diligence process. But uh, again, very important to have a clear national, you know, applicable uh, legal standard and also international good practice or standards and the accreditation. Accreditation is very helpful to assure. And also the reporting format. Those are, you know, ingredients to make a sound uh, financial decision. And of course, if you look at the, uh, you know, the climate change issue, this is a more wider issue. Uh, for example, the institution I used to work for has a target, 50% uh, uh, of investment need to go, the greenhouse gas reduction investment. So institutional commitment as such exists. Um, so uh, those things could be uh, you know, applicable for very much in you know, the pharma context. And as coming from international institution, I just uh, did a little bit in you know, homework. And the idea is uh, perhaps uh, the other speakers are aware, but this was new for me. UNEP is working on this uh, uh, pharma environmental persistent pharmaceutical pollution, uh, you know, the piece of the work. And this would be a uh, Perhaps you know, for international financial institution, again, uh, need to look into what is a macro level, you know, the uh, 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 surveillance and then policy directions. Um, so this is also very important. And going back to the uh, AMR issue, that uh, uh, the farm animal investment risk and the return, the access to medicine and the UK uh, health and the, you know, the social uh, service, they have this uh, AMA action. Um, 
I actually oh, forget the exact name, but uh, this is a fantastic platform. And uh, they are also very much you know, supporting uh, British Standard Institute's uh, the, you know, uh, antibiotic ingredient numerical standard, and that they want to, you know, the roll out and spread more. And uh, this is a very important movement. So um, this is something, yes, uh, through my work, uh, I have observed. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I think experience from AMR is really important because that is, this, you know, sort of driving the way, if you like, in this field. And it is a, such an important connection between environmental pharmaceutical pollution and human health, which is obviously pretty important in, in driving action. Um, great. Thank you so much. Um, this is so interesting, all the discussions. Um, I have to admit, I am, because I've been so intently listening, I am not, I have not been reading all of the chat um, but there's there's quite a lot of questions. Um, I can see a few from Jason Snape. Jason, do you want to um, do you have a quick question? Because we've only got eight minutes, so uh, we'll have a couple of really quick questions. There, have you got any pressing ones that you want to ask quickly? I think there's probably two I, I can flag there. One is obviously the farmer industry know what's safe. They've known what's safe since 2006, where they've been required to do an environmental risk assessment for their products so they have PNEX and those PNEX are published on the EPAR. So it is absence of any prescriptive regulation on safe API discharges, absence of corporate responsibility or corporate liability. And, and then the, the other question is, is really around the barriers for the generic industry, because, because clearly the innovation industry can integrate the CAPEX and OPEX associated with safe discharges into the cost of the medicines, but try, try to do it retrospectively actually on a, a generic medicine, there's going to be some barriers. So, so Sam, it's, it's what do you think maybe some of those barriers might be uh, and how might we overcome them? Thanks, Jason. Sam, do you want to try and answer them? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jason. A uh, straightforward, simple question. I think that, yeah, those, those barriers exist, I think, I mean, not just for the generics industry, but at all established medicines, <clears throat> really. Um, and I think it goes back to some of that prioritization um, that I was talking about and the integration piece. And I think making sure that whatever we put in place, um, conscious of time, whatever we put in place um, actually has the impact that we desire. So I think we need to be making sure that where we want to make an impact, we actually have an impact. And it's not just um, a a gesture towards trying to make reductions and things in those those spaces so we need to understand properly where we want to have those impacts and how we can um how we can fund those and as you say things like generic medicines where we've got high quantities and low margins might be hit unduly with the cost of those the burden of the cost of those things so i think we need to be very sure about where the risks sit as jason highlights we know where the safe concentrations are. And actually we have a reasonably good understanding of where and what the concentrations are in the environment. Um, we don't have great monitoring data, but we do have a lot of monitoring data available. Um, and we can utilize that along with the predictions that we can do to try and prioritize effectively where the best treatment can be placed to treat the right thing at the right place and reduce what we need to reduce without having undue impacts where it's not necessary. Great. It is a difficult, yeah, that's a difficult one to solve today. Yeah, in, in one minute, but you did you did well. <laughs> well done. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Jason, for the question. Um, It does seem like, you know, we could have easily filled a whole day of this with this topic. Um, So I'm just going to go, there's a, the, the, you know, in terms of the number of likes, the question that's got three likes is for Professor Zhang Chendi. Um, so the paradox you mentioned about polluting companies being more profitable and how their stock price seems insulated from reputation effects and does little to lower their value. How might the market begin to break this paradox? Well, uh, it takes a long time. And I think there is a follow, follow up question on sort of uh, public versus private solutions, regulators versus market. I'll answer both together. Well, I'll uh, maybe use tobacco as an example, tobacco industry. So, so uh, I guess the first evidence on tobacco so hurting health, um, bad society, society probably published a long time ago. Um, 
50, 70 years ago. Uh, but still, I think nowadays tobacco industry is still among the most profitable uh, industry uh, in the market, right? But it doesn't mean all the investors putting their money in there, right? Things will change. Uh, their valuation gets smaller and smaller, right? Still, some investors invest in them, they're profitable, but a lot of big investors start to move away because of the negative externalities for the, for the society, the impact for, for, for society, right? So that's how uh, the awareness and education and research so important. So this raised the awareness of the pollution, in this case, pharmaceutical pollution. Uh, and at the end, investors so take that into account, but it takes a long time. Um, and then, um, well, the market solution isn't um, going to be, uh, I mean, enough uh, for, for providing solution. So I, I do believe, uh, again, uh, using tobacco industry as an example, it takes a long time. The regulations need to come in. Uh, reg uh, again, uh, using like uh, carbon emissions as example, another example. You need sort of these uh, incentives uh, from market to change, right? You have, we, we see big change in electric vehicles. So those things start to work, uh, renewable energies, right? So if there are those incentives for right incentives for uh, pharmaceutical firms, for, for utility companies, uh, and then hopefully that lowers the cost of capital um, for financing those sort of water treatments projects, sort of developing so far more uh, sustainable drugs, et cetera. And that eventually that's good for um, firm value there and therefore good investment case, but it takes a long time. Thank you. Thanks, Chendi. Um, yeah, so, so much to think about. And again, that comes back to our systems approach you know we we can't just have one there's no silver bullet here we need action from across the whole system um, and that's what we're hoping to develop um we've only we've only got two minutes left um i know there's loads of questions in there i see there's a bit of a discussion about the um the healthcare sector and how we can sort of you know sort of improve investment into prevention i think that's really interesting uh, a whole other topic and uh yeah clearly there's a lot to discuss here but just as a final question for a very quick answer to anybody and if anybody in the audience has got any thoughts on this as well you know what what is our next step as a pharma pollution hub you know we are raising awareness that's our plan we want to raise awareness we want to bring people together what do you think is the next step here? Um, how do we take this forward? And yeah, like I say, welcome ideas in the chat, but anybody in our panel, would you like to throw out any thoughts here as well? Courtney. Just a one sentence is there's an initiative called Biopharma Sustainability Roundtable where they brought the investor community together with the biopharma organizations to create an ESG guidance on what needs to be reported and sustainability reports by the pharma industry to the financial investment community. I think there are a number, the 12 topics in there. One of them is PI and pharmaceuticals in the environment and AMR, antimicrobial resistance. But the evidence question of, of what needs to be shown there in that guidance is a little bit lighter touch than some of the other areas. So I think there could be an opportunity for collaboration there of saying, well, they've already convened those two parties together could this hub end up being feeding into what needs to be evidenced there and raising awareness through that? That could be something tangible, I think. Yeah, great. Thank you, Courtney. Great suggestion. Um, okay, it's two o'clock. So any, you know, please do get in touch with me if anybody has any other ideas. We'll have to decide how to take this forward. There's clearly so much to discuss in this field. But thank you so much to our panelists. It was super interesting. And thank you to everybody for joining us. And hopefully we will be back with more at some point. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kelly. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.